What is your thoughts on Byzantine Catholicism and its rise in popularity recently among Catholics? I'm not familiar with part of it. So part of that it's rising in popularity, I would know that. My understanding is that the Byzantine rite for the Roman Catholics is doing the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. This is what I think I've been told. I've never been to a service. So that it's, it's the liturgy we have. I don't know if the priests are like allowed to be married, if it's kind of a separate type of Catholic. But for the the way we would see it is that it's Roman Catholic. You know, it's not like not Roman Catholic, but the liturgy is very beautiful and transformative. And, uh, you know, I think maybe one thing I could say is having visited, uh, we were in the Holy Land before the war, we were in the Holy Land this summer and visiting some of the Catholic churches, they don't have... Oftentimes it's pretty stark. It's like a concrete building with some wood, maybe very beautiful, like from an architectural standpoint, but not from like a transcendent standpoint. There's like nothing to, it's like a big room. So maybe there's an attraction just to having like worship be more than singing the songs or whatever and uh, that people have. And so if that, if it wouldn't surprise, it doesn't surprise me. If, if what you're saying is true, I'm not surprised, right? Because we see it in the Orthodox Church. People are really hungry for the faith, the tradition of the, like, traditional life um, around it. I think for the Orthodox, we look and see it's a Roman Catholic Church. So Orthodoxy isn't just that liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, you know? And, and, and as much as it is, it's an outpouring of our faith. And the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church are not the same. They're not the same church. So there's di there's so many different teachings and divergent mindset, like phronema, like ethos, like how even to think about things that we, I think the Orthodox look and go, you know, that's a Catholic place, you know, so. Not, not as a big put down, by the way, just, it's not the same. The next question is, what advice would you give someone struggling with the sexual passions? Man, a lot, most people struggle with sexual passions. Gosh, it kind of depends. I mean, they, they, you need a spiritual father. <laughs> I'm always running home to mama, which is, you need a spiritual father. The first is to confess your sins, you know, like, don't buy into what the world says that it's like normal, whatever that sexual passion is, like, you know, a passion is like something that's like taken root, you know, and if you can think about the beginnings of where that thing started, it probably wasn't a full grown tree that couldn't just be easily removed. It was probably just a, like a little like weed that could just be like plucked right out. Like, oh, I shouldn't look at that, or I shouldn't think about that, or I shouldn't act in that way. And it could be like easily kind of removed from our life. And instead people spend years, I mean, Every, like lots of people spend years like developing a habit to go with the passion instead of the struggle to be pure and follow the Lord. If something's an actual addiction, they should seek help, you know, as much as they can. They should find like who, anybody to any, any, all the help they need anywhere they can find it. You know, someone's really got like a sexual addiction, they should consider some kind of sexual addiction help, you know? The first thing is to confess and to be honest. And um, even better if you're, if this is something that doesn't involve a spouse, but to, if the spouse can handle it, to even talk about it, like in a way saying like, I need help, I'm not, I've had this struggle or I'm having the struggle, you know? It takes wisdom, like it's not, there's not one clear path on how to, to, to deal with sexual passions, but the first is that is probably to believe that the Lord can heal us and to trust the Lord and to call on his name and to beg for help and to confess your sins and to like, you know, take radical steps, like throw the phone into the lake, you know, set up your computer. So if it's looking at things like computer, set up your computer so that there's like parental controls, you know, get rid of, get rid of the temptation, you know, they, Alcoholics don't go to bars. If you've got sexual temptations and it's whatever, you got to avoid the places where those things happen. And 
sometimes it's, I mean, it's the, it's something that's, you know, the sexual life for the married person is something that the Lord gives and is a good thing. And it's so easily twisted to be destructive. And we, we, we do it. It's not like the devil has to like work very hard and he like just tweaks it one second and we're like off to the races. So there's so many variables, so many situations people are in. And, uh, but it, good counsel usually is like, if there's a trigger, or if there's a way this thing starts, that has to be dealt with. And oftentimes like it's a mask for other problems, frankly, like it's sort of easy to say, I just have lustful thoughts. And it's like, well, what, what else is there? You know, what else are you dealing with? Like what else is going on? You know, and oftentimes people have other issues that are making it worse. So be, the human person's complicated, but the Lord is quick to heal people. And even if he allows struggle and we've got, you know, St. Joseph has a cast and all kinds of people that had to deal with lustful demons. I mean, just all the way back, everybody probably has to deal with lustful demons. But, you know, once you've given in, what can be done is it takes, it takes a lot of healing. As a questioning Protestant, the thing that keeps me back from converting is the veneration of saints and of Mary. I don't want to pray to anyone other than God, as I don't see any biblical or historical evidence that the apostles were taught by God to do so. When did praying to Mary and the saints historically become an acceptable practice? And how can I be sure I'm not doing something pagan by praying to Mary or the saints? Thank you. I think growing up, like the person said they were Protestant, I think like growing up Protestant where yeah, that's kind of been a drum that's been banged on so long, it's hard to even imagine that the Orthodox are not actually like worshiping Mary and the saints, like pagans might have other gods or something. So you grow up in the mindset, like that's what they're doing. You know, the Catholics, the Orthodox, they're bad, you know, or something. And in the life of the church, we, we, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll start this. Like we don't view the dead as dead <laughs> in Christ. So it's like, we have a, we have like, what do they say in Hebrews? We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So there's not like, I'm my own witness or I'm on my own. It's, we're surrounded. And like in the Orthodox Church, we're literally surrounded by, especially in this one, a cloud of witnesses. I mean, there's St. Nicholas and archangels and Mary of Egypt, and it goes on and on. The myrrh-bearing women, the woman at the well, like all these saints. And if someone came up, to the icon of Fotini, the woman at the well, and with Christ, you know, we wouldn't be going up to the woman at the well saying, like, save me, woman at the well. I don't have time to pray to God. You know, we would look at her as like the example to follow, you know, like, and we would, we could ask for her intercessions, you know, and she could be a, used by the Lord in a powerful way. You know, I always think about like in the Protestant world, you know, they ask each other for prayer, like we, everybody does, Orthodox, God, whatever. Christians, we go pray for me. Well, when someone dies, we just, we keep doing it because we don't think they're dead. We think if they died in Christ, they're alive in Christ. So we don't do it in a seance way or some kind of weird pagan thing. It's, it's why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we call the Theotokos Mary, Theotokos, the Greek word for bearer of God, mother of God. Why wouldn't we like ask for her intercessions because we love her? Like, why wouldn't we, you know, the beginning of, in Luke's gospel, she says, all generations will call me blessed. We don't want to be living in the one generation that didn't do that. You know? So we, you talk about like scripture, we look at scripture. What does scripture say? All generations and call me blessed, you know? So maybe if like, if a, if a friend was sitting in front of me and asked me that question, you know, I might say, are you calling her blessed? Like, let's start with like a little respect, you know, like a little love for the mother of God. And we look at like, the Orthodox look at our salvation history. We look at the salvation history of the world. Well, I mean, we could even say like, it starts before the incarnation, 
but since it's the time for us right now, the time of nativity, like what's happening? You know, there's this young woman who says yes to the Lord. And she becomes like the prime example for us. Like she, she says yes to the Lord and gives birth to God, the word in her own heart and into the world. And for us, it's a family affair. So like his mother becomes like so dear to us that we call on her for help, but we don't see her as like, we can't get to Jesus without her. We just love her also. And not in some pagan worship way, like no one does any kind of weird pagan rites. Although what we do might be unfamiliar to a Protestant. We don't do anything weird. Like, <laughs> But um, when we don't see her as like a fourth member of the Trinity, like she's not that. And no saint, none of the saints are or something. So there's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Trinity, you know, one in essence and undivided. And Mary is 100% human, as all, all, all the saints. But when we see their lives, we see, both kind of from the outside, we can look at their lives and see, like, sanctification of the human person. Like, this works. Like, people are meant to be saints. And we have all these saints, and, and we call on them for help because they have the grace of God to help us. Jesus has a great line. He says, these things that I do, great, greater things. You'll do greater things than this, you know? And it's like, who is he talking to? The apostles, but even those coming, you know? So we have saints throughout to this minute, to this minute, walking the earth, there are saints. And we have saints being recognized to this minute. Think about someone like St. Porphyrius in Greece. St. Porphyrius, people would come to him. He had never met them before, would not even know where they were from as far as they knew. And he would tell them about their town to the point of like how the water tastes there. It's like, what is that? I don't even, that's incredible. And he, he'd say, your town is devoted to, you know, three saints. And they'd be like, no, no, there's only two churches in our little town in Greece. There's St. George and St. Barbara or something. He'd be like, no. There's a little chapel in the mountains dedicated to, you know, St. Bartholomew, some other saint, you know, and, and uh, it's incredible, this little chapel. And they're like, no one knows about this, you know. And um, there's, no, there's no worship that goes on. This parish I'm in is St. Ignatius of Antioch. Yesterday, the 20th of December, we celebrated his feast day. It wasn't given to like weird pagan rites. We read one of the letters he wrote or actually, we didn't read one of the letters. We wrote, we read about his life. You know, he wrote seven letters, including, he was, we're talking about 108. We're talking about he's a disciple of the disciples. He's the child that Jesus picks up and says, unless you become like this child, not just any child, this child. You know, it's an incredible thing. So why wouldn't we show him any reverence or love or ask for his intercessions? You know, even just to imitate Trajan who, persecuted St. Ignatius, stopped persecuting Christians after he killed St. Ignatius because of St. Ignatius's witness and power, like strength. So we don't have like a weird St. Ignatius like rituals. We just know like he's, he figured it out. We, we can copy and imitate him and we can ask for his help. He's not dead. If he were dead, it would be weird. But in that he's alive, it's like asking anybody to pray for you. So, so I mean, he wrote seven letters. We have them. I mean, we have the New Testament. We have these letters also. His letter to the Romans, he's, it's like Eucharistic. St. Ignatius of Antioch, what, what a saint. A saint, like we, we need him so badly, so badly. He, he was just made of different stuff, probably. Actually, I mean, the truth is he's made of the same stuff. That's why we need him so badly. But he wrote this letter to the Romans. As he's being led in chains to Rome, chains in Rome, and you know, the church in the year 100 is being persecuted, but there's, there's people in Rome that probably could have stopped his, his being thrown as an old man, 100 years old or whatever he was, to being thrown to the lions in the arena and um, the circus, whatever they call it in Rome. And he wrote letters saying, don't stop it. I'm finally going to live. Like I'm finally going to become a disciple of Christ 
if the lions will tear me up. And he makes all this Eucharistic like, like references that they'll grind his bones like grain. He'll be the bread of God. He, I mean, he basically like puts himself out as like almost communion himself. It's incredible. Don't stop me from living. And what we would write is don't stop me from dying. But he saw that his death would be life. So he was so, he was so clear headed about it. Like we really need this. Anything that makes us uncomfortable, we like throw a big fit. They, we even blame God. Like we say, God doesn't love me because I've got this problem. Meanwhile, he was trying, basically trying to be martyred. Like I'm not going to sacrifice to pagans. And so they're like, well, we'll kill you. We're going to, we're going to march you through Thrace and Mesopotamia or whatever, all this places to get all the way to Rome as an old man with these chains. He referred to it, the soldiers around him, by the way, as lions too. And then he gets in to the arena and he says to the men of Rome, men of Rome, he gives like this tiny little speech because they release the lions and we rip them apart, except for his heart and all the major bones, it says, big leg bones or whatever. And um, he addresses them, I've committed no crime. I'm only here because I love God. It's an incredible thing, like St. Ignatius of Antioch. And he becomes like, he's not the first because it's, we have St. Stephen in scripture you know, being stoned to death and all of this in Acts. But, but the first, one of the very first that we have like these full stories of that's accurate because he wrote these seven letters, which are extant. We have them. You can just probably PDF them off the internet. And his letter to the Romans is particularly, all of them are, it's incredible. The bravery, the love for God. And, you know, you talk about well, kind of, if the question really could be asked, like, what do saints have to offer us? Like, why do we have to even mess with saints? It's like, I don't know, like, I think we're sort of made, the human person is made to, to be in relationship, to have communion and to have someone who's in the faith, the church, who's lived the, who can like be persecuted for righteousness sake and blessed the best. Yeah, there's some actually kind of bloody icons, like people pay because the, they tore him up. You know, he, he, it wasn't like, and he, he was, by the way, he was glad. He, he, like I said, the, the letter he wrote was like, please don't stop me from living. I'll finally, this will finally like make, make it happen. And in some, some way it's translated, it's like, I'll finally become a human person. Like I'll finally happen because I will have given myself fully over to Christ. And yeah, incredible.